all good things come to an end. That's what Jonathan Marcheseau's reaction was after not being able to come to terms with the Vegas Golden Knights. More about what the former VGK star told the Cam and Strick podcast ahead, right here on this edition of Locked On Golden Knights. Your Locked On Golden Knights, your daily podcast on the Vegas Golden Knights, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi again, everyone. Tony Cardasco and Chris Golick from Las Vegas. Thanks for making us your first uh, listen each and every day. Find us wherever you get your podcast. Please subscribe to our Locked On Golden Knights YouTube channel. We are brought to you today by Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Use the promo code Locked On NHL. You will get twenty dollars off of your purchase. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Jonathan yeah, Marshall. Give me chills about the old Chicago Bulls. What's what time is it? Game time. With their whole three games. That was yeah. uh that's kind of good. I'll, I'll, good You're job, game time. Good, good copy. Good copy. Okay. <laughs> Jonathan Marshall so was interviewed on the uh, Cam and Strick podcast talking about a variety of topics, including perhaps a lack of loyalty by VGK. Marshall saw who was a day one golden knight, said that he didn't have any real things to consider he thought that he did a good enough job in the past seven seasons to deserve a new deal said he was not asking for anything outrageous not trying to steal a bank or anything like that (laughs) is what he uh, said specifically it's life and you move on marshall said vgk stopped at a three-year deal marshall wanted a four-year contract didn't you say that you thought that he wanted five years for term? Because four I years, had, I thought, was always the deal. I had thought four and five was the contingent point. Uh, March or so, the BBGK offering four, March or so, wanting to get to five. That's kind of what I heard through the tea leaves. Yeah, and um, I told you, and I told you four from day right. One. And my my okay. point is now this. I think you know. I, I mentioned last week. I've been a lot more positive and stuff. And. I mean, about? I think my exact quote, I think my exact quote actually was I, I got over my hissy fit about March or so and started to look forward to the season and everything. And then March or so goes and does this interview and pisses me all off again. And you know, I'm not happy right now. I was, I was in the car driving. I was pissed off enough because I'd forgot something at my shop where I, I pick up for my, my cards and stuff. So I'd, I I have to go all the way to basically 215 in Flamingo. I got the 215 in Decatur heading back towards Henderson. And I'm like, oh, and a few four-letter words that came up in the podcast that I can't say here. So I had to go back and listen to more of the interview. And so, yeah, here we are. We're, we're grumpy again right now. But, you know, the fact that it simply was one year of term, like five years, okay, fine. I, I get VGK saying that's too much. But four years, like that's just, I don't know. And the fact that. March so himself was trying to negotiate with Kelly, and I'm sure you'll you'll take us down that path in a little bit later. You know, I mean, uh, March so did everything he could on the ice, in the locker room, and off the ice, and it's unfortunate that the team couldn't find the desire, if you will, to give him that fourth year. So something I deal with sometimes as a consultant, I deal with businesses that have the wrong people sometimes in place, or they just don't want those people to be around that organization, but they don't know how to stink and tell people to go away. They don't know how to fire people. They don't. And that could be the case with VGK. Hear me out. So I like, you know, that Marsha so took matters into his own hands. According to what he said on the podcast, he said at first he had Pat Brisson uh, speaking on his behalf to VGK. Then around the start of free agency, Marshall says to himself, hey, I know these guys. I talk to Kelly. Um, I talk to McCrimmon every day. I talk to George McPhee every day. So he picks up the phone and he calls them both on back-to-back days. And he asks the general manager, McCrimmon, hey, what's going on? Cannot get a straight answer. Cannot. Can we come to terms, he says? And then he calls McPhee the next day. And he gives Marcia so the royal runaround. That's what we call it in the biz, the royal runaround. Kelly's taking care of all negotiations. Step it up, guys. 
Just be honest with people. Be transparent. Their lives are on the line. And, you know, it's like they don't know how to tell people or to get rid of people or to deal with people in the proper manner. That's poor business, bro. I hate to say that. That's what it sounds like to me. And then Sunday says there's signs of nothing. Uh, they show nothing at all. And they weren't budging. And so on three consecutive days, and then he goes, okay, um, I want to go to Nashville. Seems like they have it going on. Uh, he said between Nashville and Florida, those were the top two toughest teams that VGK had faced in the past season. So, and since, and since that point, they, they, every day for seven years, right? They know each other. They show up at work together. They say hi. They just go back and forth, extending pleasantries, getting their cars detailed together every day, uh, eating BLTs. With I knew I was waiting for that. I knew that was coming there. Every single stinking day, Chris. And Marsha so said he has not spoken to McCrimmon or McPhee since. This is just bad business. Just be honest with people. Yeah, just go away is what they're telling Marsha so. But they don't know how to tell him that they don't want him around the organization anymore. It seemed like on that Sunday is when that officially happened, when Marsha so per the interview, called Kelly and basically it's to use your quote from the way you open the show, all, I guess all good things must come to an end. So it happened. Um, did it need to get drawn out like that? I don't know. Was there a glimmer of hope where VGK was going to possibly give March? So that fourth year was VGK hoping that eventually March so was going to uh, give in and just take the, take the three-year deal. I guess that's the, 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 what we don't know. And, you know, to, I guess my perspective on everything else, Tony, about the business and the communication, I think my response honestly is so what? So what? This is the culture and this isn't a bad thing, I guess, but and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm jumping on the bandwagon here, but this is who the Vegas Golden Knights are. I have been very complimentary of Kelly McCrimmon, and I think my quote was something along the lines of how he conducts his business in an unapologetic manner. And I think I went farther to say not it, it, with him not being concerned about the way things are going to look through the media with the fans and things like that. Um, you know, some of the things Marcheseau did talk about are talking about the locker room. Uh, he referenced Robin Leonard. And Robin Leonard on paper having a great season, but the Golden Knights not maybe thinking about the locker room and things like that. And then obviously Marcheseau went on to talk about how he feels his effect on the locker room is and how positive he is and everything. And he mentioned that in his conversations with Kelly McCrimmon down the stretch trying to get a deal done. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter. So, you know, this is who the Golden Knights are. And you're going to, as a fan, as a journalist as a podcaster as a writer as whatever the heck we are these days it's something that we all need to get used to because this is the life of being a southern professional hockey supporter in las vegas your favorite player is going to be gone your the player you enjoyed the most is going to be gone we're about to talk about in the third segment another misfit who has no signs of an extension even being discussed right now so this is life with the Vegas Golden Knights. Tony, you're a Yankees fan, right? You've been through this for the last however many decades you've been on this, this earth, you know. Just a couple. Is, it's a lot. It's a lot. So, you know, it is what it is, Golden Knights fans. It is what it is. And at the end of the day, it, there's still hopefully going to be a competitive product on the ice. Obviously, we'll see what, once, uh, once the camps get going how things look. So was I a little bit too harsh in that first uh, segment, second segment? Well, I don't I think so. Just I don't talking think. About I mean, him? no, you have the same emotion that I had all summer and that a lot of fans had. And going back to the flurry trade. But, uh, but after, back therapy, after therapy, you're much better. Now. Okay, no, but okay, but here. Okay, good. I like that comparison, actually. Therapy. What was the therapy, Tony? The therapy was getting over the fact that Marcia so has gone and that they didn't deal with them the right Go way. Before that, the therapy right now is a Stanley Cup. All right. The therapy happened in 2023 when the Golden Knights lifted the Stanley Cup off T Mobile Ice after defeating a team nine to three 
in an absolute rout and an absolute rout of a Stanley Cup final. So all this leads to something. Hopefully it leads to another Stanley Cup. And if the Golden Knights do get it together, it's a tall order, I know. But if the Golden Knights get it together this season or next season, remember the Marc-Andre Fleury trade, it didn't trigger a Golden Knights Stanley Cup immediately, but it certainly got things there the following season in 2022, 2023, or two seasons later. So March is so, yeah, it sucks right now, but March is so not being a Golden Knight right now could trigger. I mean, what if Alex Holtz pops? What if Olivson pops? What if the opening on the winger leaves opportunity for Brisson and Dorofia? So, you know, that's the approach right now. And I'll, my last comment, I guess, will be Kelly McCrimmon has a stellar credit rating when it comes to this sort of thing. Okay, so March has said that he understands change and getting better. Adding players and moving players is the norm, as he knows. But March has said that there's only a few guys in the organization that you have to treat well. You have to take care of them. You got to know who you want to treat really well. And he says that's something that's lacking. In Las Vegas, that's something that that's lacking. So you do have your stars. You do have your people that have invested time. You do have your people that are great in the community, that are good citizens on and off the ice and are pretty much the go to guys. And that's I understand what he's saying. That's any team, though. That's any team. But shouldn't they treat shouldn't they have treated him better? And the fact that they haven't even spoken to him in the aftermath. They not only had a business relationship, they had a personal relationship. Here's a guy that was pretty much, he was with this organization from day one. He comes in with a chip on his shoulder, scores 30 goals, as he said, in Florida. And then they just go, okay, we're going to leave you unprotected. And so he's like, I mean, <laughs> the guy's always performed. He's always performed. That was the Panthers GM just absolutely to quote March or so overthinking things and protecting all the <laughs> defensemen and all that and shipping Riley Smith as part of the deal. That was probably the biggest blunder of the expansion situation. Um, do you think Stamkos talks to his GM in Tampa anymore? I mean, did Jack, I mean, Eichel's relationship in Buffalo wasn't very good. Obviously we know that, but I'm sure Buffalo isn't, uh, you know, whoever the GM is in, with the Sabres isn't calling Eichel to see how things are going. Maybe they, I don't know. Maybe they are friends. Who knows? I'm, I'm just uh, shooting at the hip right now, but you know, at the end of the day, again, it's the business, it's the business. And you know, something about the, the crest on the front, more important than the name on the back. And I get that. And I understand March raw emotion. Like I get it a hundred percent. You understand it. The fans understand it. I don't know what, more March or so could have done to put himself in his spots to remain in Vegas. There's nothing more he could have done. But that said, sometimes, at least in the eyes of Kelly McCrimmon, George McPhee, that's, you know, and Bill Foley for to keep going here. I'm sure Foley was involved in all this. I guarantee Foley had to have some involvement in all of this. Of course. Of course. But at the end of the day, it was Let's in the eyes the of box. Vegas. I'm not, handling, I'm not handling negotiations. Let's well, send it back to McCrimmon. Yeah, no, I get that. But square wow. peg, round hole. And you know what? If that's the case, fine. The, made men, you know, the made men do not know. They don't know how to handle business. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You just said. I'm sorry. You, you just said that the, the the presidents and the general manager of a team that has don't interrupt me that has won three Pacific titles, two Western Conference titles, a Stanley Cup title, and missed the playoff once in seven seasons. Don't know how to handle business. They don't know how, how to handle point, personal man. relationships. That's good. Personal there. relationships, fine. They're terrible. Okay, who cares? Well, they don't do it the right way. Coming okay. up next. Marcia on his coaches. Who cares? Marcia saw on his coaches. Back with more right after this on this spicy edition spicy. of Locked On Golden Knights. Game time, you know, they have a new feature called Game Time Picks, and that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. What Game Time Picks does is it filters out all of the fluff to show you only the incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste your time by searching through thousands of tickets. It's pretty good, and they have something called uh, super deals now. They're really good. They show you different tiers of deals, 
And uh, there's so much going on at game time. You need to check it out. We do have a big concert here on Friday night, and that's Pink. Uh, she'll be performing over at Allegiant Stadium. Place to get your ticks. Game time, of course. Uh, they've got seat views before you buy. Lowest price guarantee. Event cancellation protection. Job loss protection, which is really good. And that's something that Marsha so should have gotten for his game time tickets because he lost his job here in Vegas. Uh, game time's ticket coverage your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets today. So go and download the Game Time app. Chris and I both have it. We utilize it daily. I'll create an account. Use the promo code. I like the all in pricing personally. Uh, create an account. Use the promo code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Use the redeem code. Locked on NHL for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. Are we there? Is Chris, we lose you. Uh, welcome back on this edition. I'm here. Locked on Golden Knights. You left I was putting chili. I put the chili powder in my coffee. Chili. Wait a second. Come back, man. What what do you what's this tradition? What, what do you do? Chili powder. It was a joke, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Marcia So on Bruce Cassidy, Cam and Strick podcast, and uh, listen to this almost in its entirety. That thing just went on and on and on. Uh, it was good, though. It was good. Some of these, I can't stand some content. of these long podcasts. This was a good segment. Yeah, I don't really particularly get the two-hour-plus podcast myself. The interview itself was like over 45, 50 minutes, something like that. It was long. Uh, so he talks about Bruce Cassidy. First, we would MF each other a couple of times in a year, yelling like, blank you, and all that kind of stuff. Um, he would tell me that I can endure it, <laughs> so they keep it going, Marcheseau says of Cassidy. He said that uh, they would use it. Cassidy would use this as fuel to get the team going, and the team responds, well, I would have loved to have caught these two yelling at each other in the hallways or on the ice. And we've seen them chirping at each other before. Um, he said that, however, he will always respect Bruce Cassidy because why? He won with the guy. He said Cassidy made it a point. This is his team. And he likes that. And he said if he ever gets into coaching, he might even model himself after a Bruce Cassidy because he just won and he did it his way. He did it his way. And, you know, players on the team uh, still, he said, do not like Bruce Cassidy. <laughs> and, and, but he can't say anything bad because of his track record. So, I mean, I'm just trying to picture when you said March is so coaching, I'm trying to picture March. So as a coach right now and uh, what that would be like, that Doesn't would be a lot of fun. Kid? Actually, it would be it'd fun. Be, it'd be a lot of fun. Um, Listen, you knew, we knew, everyone knew the relationship between not just March so and Cassidy, but the, a lot of players take exception to the way Coach Cassidy handles his business. He's not the easiest coach to work for. Let's just be completely bluntly honest about this. You and I, Tony, even during the Stanley Cup run, were concerned that there was issues with Cassidy losing the locker room. Uh, that certainly was a lot more noteworthy during this past season. Uh, one former player did tell me that there was concern, not concern, but he did feel that the locker room had been lost at parts of the season last year. So this is real stuff here. And the fact that Jonathan March is coming out and talking about Cassidy in this way, it, it's very interesting because Cassidy might be, or excuse me, March so might be the toughest player to impress, so to speak, on the team, right? March so is going to be honest. It doesn't matter. I, mean, I, I can see March so walking right into Bill Foley's office and being like, hey, why why is this happening? And that's who Jonathan March so is. But if March so now comes back and says through all these all these moments of turmoil between him and Cassidy and everything, if he's still coming out and saying he'll always respect the guy and everything, like that's not fluff. March so doesn't need to talk up Coach Cassidy. He doesn't no. need to say anything no, that's positive about that's genuine. Coach that's Cassidy. That's genuine. That's who it is. is. He's going to tell you if it's good or bad. I mean, he talked about Patrick Waugh 
and all the issues that he had with him and Wow was really tough on him and how he treated Marshall so different than other players. And Marshall so was like had a three point night in a victory in which his team won like three to two. And Wah still said, you know, you weren't good tonight. Like what? Like, and then, but, but again, coaches sometimes have to be difficult, have to be hard, have to get the most that they possibly can because their expectations are probably greater for players like Marsha saw. And, and that's what happened. And now what happens? Marsha saw later on now sees Patrick Waugh and he respects him and likes the guy because of what he did to help bring out the best in Jonathan Marshall. And I think the same thing applies with uh, a Bruce Cassidy and, and a Gerard Gallant. So Gallant, he said, uh, they're in a meeting here at VGK and out of nowhere, Gerard Gallant is not going to be your coach anymore. And he's like, what? I don't get it. It was kind of shocking to everyone. I felt at the time, but he said, he's the kind of guy that you ran through a wall for because um, he was a player's coach. And he said the firings in Florida and in Las Vegas were uncalled for. Yeah. I mean, the Florida situation, the taxi, that's never going to, uh, never going to be forgotten, I guess. And I, I still remember with, with Gallant. I mean, I was driving to, I was driving to work and my phone started lighting up one day. And obviously I'm driving, so I'm not going to peek too closely at it. But I peeked. I saw like the message on my car popping up and all that. I'm like, wait a minute. So, I mean, I didn't really put a radio station on because you can't really get an AM station in Vegas to talk about hockey at eight in the morning. Unfortunately, maybe maybe we'll get to that point one day in Vegas as far as sports radio coverage goes. But Vegas definitely is not anywhere near that yet, unfortunately. But I'm already getting to work get in my office. OK, let's get some work done. Ah, first, let's dig into this Glant situation, see what's going on. And I'm like, oh. Okay, Glant got got fired. Here comes and then here goes Pete DeBoer. So you know, back to the the Golden Knights operating in this just unapologetic way and not giving a giving a you know what about what the fans think about how they're going to run things. I mean, Pete DeBoer came in. You know, Pete, everyone's cool about the Pete DeBoer situation now, but Pete DeBoer was the biggest anti. Uh, not sure what the terminology I'm looking for. The biggest enemy, if you will, coming in. So you know, this oh, is well, back. Glant called him a clown. Remember? March or so? No. Gallant called DeBoer a clown. Oh god, that was great. That was a lot you of forgot fun. I forgot about do, that. Yeah. I do remember that. And they and they they did I think they both made made good made good on that. I think there's a conversation that they you know came to terms about all that. But yeah, that's just uh that's so much and, fun. And, I mean, and March so doesn't even mention DeBoer. In the, in the interview he did it but i don't think there was any lack of respect in there i think it's just the, the way the interview went and stuff but you know well, on the gold remember, Knights, we, i was concerned about how marcia so sorry to cut you off there no, you're good, but you're I, was, good. I was concerned about how marcia so might react after the firing and then going to DeBoer. and at first he was pissy pants he wasn't uh he did not like it. It showed again his emotions come through, and I, I could tell he on. did not like DeBoer. But now he's going to say I respect the guy because DeBoer's first game. And if I'm wrong, someone's welcome to uh, get me here on this. But hip check March. Here. So uh, DeBoer's first game, I believe, was in Ottawa with the Vegas Golden Knights. I don't recall. And okay. after the game, he was pre- uh, Pete DeBoer was presented the game puck. Who gave him that game puck? Oh, was it was it Marsha so? I'm about eighty seven point four percent because we always have was to have that a hook. the occasion where he also gave him the clown nose Stop it. and the puck. Um, no, but I believe it was March so that presented the game puck to DeBoer and just a sign of welcome. Here you are. You're you're the man. Let's get this going here. Um, back to just some notes on the coaching side of things and Cassidy and the relationship with March so and the fact that. Uh, it, w- it was mentioned that the not all the guys in the locker room like Coach Cassidy. Again, short shelf life. Two and a half seasons is the average shelf life of a VGK coach. We can go a step farther. We talked about this, I believe, over the summer. Coach Cassidy is like the sixth or seventh most senior, if you will, as far as time in position, consecutive time in position at two years. So I don't know if there's a more brutal front office job than being a head coach in the National Hockey League as far as professional sports go. It's a job you're hired to be fired. So these coaches are going to come in and say, I'm doing this my way. It's going to work or it's not going to work. And even if it works, you're still probably going to fire me somewhere between three and four seasons from now. So 
I'm going to do things my way. Hopefully, I'm going to win a Stanley Cup. Cassidy did obviously do that. And Cassidy has nothing to lose now. He's got nothing to lose. He's a Stanley Cup champion. He's had a competitive team last season. There should be a competitive team this season. If the Golden Knights, if things don't go well and the Golden Knights do move on from Coach Cassidy this season or the next season or the following season or whatever it is, there will be nine teams picking up the phone inquiring about Cassidy's services. And because they like retreads and they like retreads. Wants. Yeah, they they just use the same coaches over and over. And that's and that's fine. And Cass, but now but now this is a Stanley Cup champion, Coach Cassidy, who will go to another team. He's gonna do things his way. He's gonna piss off their version of Jonathan March or so. There's gonna be a bunch of players in that locker who don't like him and rinse maybe he'll win a Stanley Cup, rinse and repeat. So, you know, again, it's this is the nature a lot of this is just the nature of the business and do the Golden Knights conduct their business differently? Heck yeah, they do. They, you know, lack of loyalty, fine. I'm I'm in on that. But would you rather be supporting the New York Islanders right now? Would you rather be watching how the Buffalo Sabres conduct business? Would you rather be watching the San Jose Sharks, how they conduct business? Sure, things are looking very up in San Jose right now, but they're still a half decade away from being a competitive team, maybe more. And that's if they do things right now. They still got to do things right, and we can – Toronto uh, – We, we enjoy the toxicity of following the Vegas Golden Knights. Oh, 100% we do because it makes our <laughs> yeah, job easy and it's fun. Thanks for all the content too. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, the medieval the me medieval empire is definitely back. They are so back. They are so back. So back. And, you know, <laughs> That's good. And Marsh is so uh, – you know, he says he doesn't want his season to end April 15th. And that's why he signed with Nashville. Said the Predators, Florida, as we mentioned, were the two toughest teams. And he will come in, he said, to Las Vegas with a chip on his shoulder. And congratulations, Jonathan, too, for selling that house. He said the sale of the house went through. So that's good news. That's good news. Yeah. That's I was really concerned on March's financial situation. I'm glad he got <laughs> the deal worked out. Coming up next, Elliot Friedman says VGK and Shea Theodore have not begun contract extension talks yet i'm shocked yeah, that, what a shocker shocker of the day the medieval empire is so so back and we'll be back with more right after this on lockdown golden knights oh no no no, no ad read yeah no ad read there <laughs> welcome back everyone tony Kredak, i got this bro. one right i was late on the last one you're in, you're in mid-season form today bro oh, uh, that's thanks fair. for making us your first listen every day find us wherever you get your podcast please make sure to chime in with all of your comments i think marcia so uh will be a focal point this week and what he said and didn't perhaps say and uh, that'll be on wtf day what the friday and uh not what the mf day like marcia so and cassidy had nearly every day and then on saturdays it's the chris and chris jr show sometimes the youtube exclusive woke up here uh smoky vegas so i thought the fog might start rolling in for all of the fog fans just the open your just open your window the fog will come right in but it's it'll be black fog, instead of what it's it used smoky to be. man it's terrible I thought, was it, so marcia saw was in the smoky mountains i guess with his new home there and we're in the Smoky Mountains today. Here in that looked nice wherever wherever March so was. I don't know if that's somewhere in Nashville. That looked nice. Like I yeah, it's just new trees home. and green and oh, he's grass. Really, and... He was flexing. He was flexing for sure. Uh, so so now, Chris, that baby Theo has arrived. <laughs> I don't. Know. I'm sorry, man. Uh, all those photos of baby Theo yesterday. Congrats to the Theodores. One hundred percent. And his wife stayed there till the end to deliver that baby. Uh, so now the baby Theo had to do it, has uh, arrived. Uh, <laughs> you would think that VGK could at least, as a sign of faith or what have you, at least start faking contract. Shut up, Tony. Uh, at least they should maybe in earnest begin contract extension talks if that's where they want to go. Um, now, for Shea Theodore, we know that he did miss three months with that upper body injury, does that give VGK any sort of leverage if they want to get a deal now because he missed all that time last season, his production was down and all of that? And then, of course, the new kid on the block, Noah Hannafin, is taking over, though, a lot of his reps on the ice. I don't think 
either side is necessarily in an advantageous position here. I think the Golden Knights will try and sell the fact that, listen, bro, you've played uh, 102 of a possible 164 regular season games over the last two seasons. I think VGK will try and use that. And then Shea Theodore and or his agent. We'll see if Theodore takes negotiations in, into his own hands because it works so well with March or so. Um, but then Theodore is going to come back with his points per game output. I mean, he's close. I mean, what? Point per 91% of his games played in the last two seasons, give or take, whatever that math is. So Theodore is going to bounce back with that. And we'll see how close or how far apart these two sides are. Uh, Friedman obviously had some good talking points in all of this. If I can find it, I might have lost it already. But to paraphrase, Theodore made the or to me, Friedman made the comment, players like to stay in Vegas. And if the, if the team wants you, they'll find a way. Right. March or so, I don't know if the team they necessarily did not want wanted him. No, they didn't, they didn't want, want him. Or they did, they want him in, in his way. So, no, Theodore, they knew a three year deal doesn't get it done. Three. They knew because they were going back and forth with Pat Prasad, they knew that three years was not enough for Jonathan. Well, Martin. they were hoping that Marshall was going to cave. And, and, and the, the, he never mentioned the amount of money that they wanted him to take. Because the money didn't matter. I think that's why. Mm-hmm. I don't think, like, I don't think, I mean, okay, if, if if the money going back really fast to March or so, if they were offering him twenty million over three seasons, would he have stayed? Like if 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 they wanted to say here, here's twenty million for three seasons, I want twenty million for four seasons. Like I think they get that deal done there if the money is the same for three seasons. I don't know. I mean, March or so, five million dollars ain't going to make or break the dude at this point of his career. At least I'm speaking not not on behalf of himself, especially but especially, especially when Petrangelo was about to buy his house because he's bought five other homes since he's been here. <laughs> no, Petrangelo's in the real estate world, but back to no, Theodore. Was, you know, the original question: Do do the Golden Knights have any the, leverage, the power, the leverage? Maybe a maybe a tiny tiny bit here. And I don't think it's going to be that much because not because of his history in Vegas, but somebody is going to give him seven times seven, Shea Theodore. Someone's going to hit him with that $50 million bag, I think. And and whether it's Vegas, I don't know if it's going to be Vegas, but you know, I, what, what, what was the projection, Tony? Was it, was he an $8 million projection? when We looked at that a while back. I'd, I'd, I can't have, I'd have to go back, but it was pretty high. It was and pretty I high. Go so into negotiations and say, baby Theo needs new shoes. That would be that would be my talking point. Uh, and, what would it say? They wouldn't what would care. It, what would it say if there's no early communications uh, between the two sides about this organization? Lack of loyalty. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? That, that's my answer, Tony. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Okay. The Golden Knights are going to do their business. They're going to find a way to ice a competitive roster. At least fake it. At least fake it. Why? 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 At least Why? start in earnest. I mean, the guy's been a loyal player in the so past. What? Doesn't matter. Honestly, Tony, listen. What matters is the product on the ice succeeding. I don't give a you know what about anything else. I don't. I don't. I get that first offer on the table. It's going to be low. You'll have a disgruntled player that you could probably unload by the trade deadline. You can unload him by the trade deadline, whether they whether they screw around with them or not. As far as offering them a a five times, you know, a five a five-year term and $6 million. Like, it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't think he's taken that. Um, Theodore knows what his value is. Theodore knows the salary cap is going up this year and the next year and the next year. So just like how we saw Stevenson and Stamkos go for well over market value, Theodore is going to say, hey, I can probably bring a lot more to the table than these two players have. I'm not even 30 years old, 30 years old and here's what I've done. And, you know, I've, I have some health issues, sure. But at the end of the day, I'm pretty good when I'm on the ice, and hopefully I'll work on getting healthier. Like, obviously, there's a lot more to it than that. But at the end of the day, this is who the Golden Knights are. This is They're the medieval empire, Tony. They're using your quote here as we're going well into overtime here, so to speak. But, uh, you know, it's the medieval empire. This is how they do business. And at the end of the day, we, whatever we are as fans, journalists, podcasts, media, clowns, as some people will say, and I'll buy that too, you know, we need to accept that this is the norm. This is the norm. And then if anyone questions the norm, three Pacific titles, two Western titles, one Stanley Cup, six of a possible seven playoff appearances in the first seven years of this organization's life. More smoke, bad. 
more smoke inside of the VGK organization or in Vegas today? That I thought you were going to say inside of my my, uh, my office, but sure. We appreciate everyone tuning in. We I got eliminated in the off. office, that's for sure. We almost went as long as the Cam and Strick podcast. It was close. It was pretty close there. Uh, <laughs> of course, don't forget, please subscribe to our Lockdown Golden Knights YouTube channel. Today's always a difficult uh, day for all of us there, especially uh, yeah. people from the East Coast. And please never forget. For Chris Golick, I'm Tony Cardasco. Have a terrific day. We'll see you again tomorrow right here on Lockdown Golden Knights. And please take care.